Three months had passed. The bandages that supported Rufus's ribs had already been removed, and finally the day had come that he could bid farewell to the cast around his leg. Kilmister solemnly handed him a walking stick. This pipe used to be part of the Shinra building. What's the situation in Midgar now? The disease is still endemic. The number of infected is rising. But there are still a lot of people working hard on the new town to the east of Midgar. The work there is progressing feverishly. Who's leading them? Well, it seems there are a number of different groups. By the way, Mr. President, do you know anything about the Shinra Company's assassins? Rufus shook his head and waited for Kilmister to continue. All those who gained unauthorized access to the company buildings and warehouses received a threatening letter. It said that they would lose their lives if they tried it again. Since the sender obviously knows their whereabouts, nobody dares to go there. <laughs> those foolish Turks. Rufus smiled to himself. Mr. President, there's still time, but I would like some of Shinra's equipment. Could you tell your assassins for me? What do you want? Rufus spoke calmly, trying to hide his very real anxiety. Professor Hojo's equipment. And you'll be using it for our treatment, I presume? Kilmister smiled, and for just a moment, Professor Hojo's sinister grin came into Rufus's mind. Of course. Also, as I mentioned before, I still need... Genova. Exactly. Where is Genova now? I don't know. I was going to look for it after leaving this place. Kilmister suddenly looked at Rufus, as if evaluating his worth. Fine. Then we must find a new location. This place is not suitable for research purposes. Research. Dr. Kilmister, are you a doctor or are you a scientist? Kilmister was silent for a moment. Your treatment is over. Kilmister took out the gun from under his lab coat and pointed it at Rufus. Afterward, Rufus took some time to learn how to walk again. Due to his still ongoing whiplash injury, he sometimes felt dizzy, but after a while, he was able to move freely in the cave complex. He took a look around at the other rooms. Some of them were no longer inhabited. The boy who had brought him food and water was now dead. There were now only three men and two women left. Four of the nine patients had already died from the disease. In one of the rooms, he saw a woman groaning in pain. She was the woman he had spoken to on the truck. Beside her sat a worried looking man taking care of her. He noticed Rufus standing there. The doctor said there isn't much medicine left, so he's reducing the dose. I gave her mine too, but it looks like it's wearing off. It didn't look like there was anything Rufus could do for them. He made his way to the treatment area and called to Kilmister. The man soon appeared in his white lab coat, looking quite frustrated. They tell me there's not much medicine left. Yes. Practically everything I had has been used up. You had medicine? Does that mean he's had a cure for this disease all along? Wait there. Kilmister disappeared for a moment and came back with a ladder. Can you climb up? Rufus grabbed hold of the ladder, thinking it was his chance for escape. He climbed up carefully and finally reached the top, but he found the barrel of Kilmister's gun pointing at his face. Hold it. You can hear me from there. Now that Kilmister was close, Rufus could see that his skin was pale, and he was sweating heavily. You don't look too well, doctor. I need medicine. What medicine? It became clear that Kilmister had been giving the patients a slightly diluted version of the stimulant that the Shinra company had administered to members of Soldier. It can't cure the disease, but it can at least alleviate the pain. So that's what their treatment is. I haven't been tricking them. I have to figure out the cause of the disease first. Until then, I can do nothing more than to deal with the symptoms. 
And you've been infected too? No. Kilmister explained that by taking a diluted version of the stimulant, he could work without sleep. But it's possible that you can become addicted too. Rufus was speechless at first, but he quickly realized that he had found a way to control Kilmister. A satisfied smile crept across his face. Do you have a phone? Or a pen and some paper? Who are you going to contact? Shinra's spies. They know where the stimulants are stored. Kilmister's eyes lit up for a moment, but he wasn't going to be guided by impulses. He ordered Rufus to go back down the ladder. A few moments later, he threw a pen and some paper down and told him to write a letter to the Turks. Rufus wrote only about the procurement of the stimulants. He needed to earn Kilmister's trust for now. The Turks would know what they had to do. Kilmister had gone to Midgar with the letter and hadn't returned for quite a while. The Turks had not appeared either. The food rations which Kilmister distributed before he left were slowly running out. Rufus had instructed Kilmister to go to the Shinra building and ask for the Turks and hand the letter over to them. He was expected to return with the medicine within three days, unknowingly leading the Turks right to him. It had now been over a week. Rufus had got into the habit of passing time by walking around the entire cave system every day. The woman's condition was getting worse and she was drifting in and out of consciousness. The man looking after her was now suffering from severe pain, but he still found the strength to hold her hand, hoping for a miracle. I'm sure Kilmister will be back soon. That moment, Rufus wondered why he had said that to them. He had nothing to support his statement. Everything went quiet all of a sudden. The fact that it had been raining outside for quite some time hadn't escaped Rufus but he never would have imagined the water would penetrate the cave. And not just the cave entrance, water was starting to leak from the ceiling too. It seemed there were small cracks in the ceiling, and water was streaming down the walls as though they were mounted with faucets. After so many days of rain, why does this suddenly have to happen now? We have to evacuate somehow. As he made his way to the entrance, he spoke to all of the other residents and briefly explained the situation to them. He stood below the cave entrance and looked up, which still hurt his neck, but there were no signs of anyone around. All he could hear was the steady patter of rain. Rufus looked around carefully. If the rainwater was to flood the entire cave, they could just float for a while until the water level had risen high enough for them to reach the exit. This is the least I can do. Rufus went back inside and told the others that they should prepare for evacuation. There was no answer. By now, the patients had gone more than a week without the stimulant, which acted as a painkiller. They were too focused on withstanding the pain to even utter a word. Rufus resolutely began carrying the patients one by one to the cave entrance. Five people, huh? All had become so emaciated that even Rufus who himself wasn't exactly in the best physical condition, was somehow able to drag them to the entrance. The water was already up to their ankles and was rising quickly. Rufus looked around for something that could serve as a flotation device. He noticed a couple of wooden beds. A piece floated away from them on the surface of the water. First he removed the metal fittings from the folding beds, then dismantled them and pushed the wooden frame together with the slats toward the entrance. They moved surprisingly fast with the current. Rufus returned to the patients. Those of you who can swim, swim. If you can't, then hold on to these frames. One person per frame. A few hours later, the water level had risen to Rufus's chin. Some of the patients could no longer stand and were relying on the wooden frames to keep them afloat. Rufus had done everything in his power. He cleared his mind and concentrated on the ledge above him. Pretty soon, he too had to take one of the slats in order to stay afloat. After a few more hours, the water had risen so far that they were only a meter or so from the ledge. Suddenly the situation had changed. The water had stopped rising. Did the rain stop or did it have something to do with the geography of the cave? Rufus bit his lower lip. We'll just have to wait for help. 
When he looked around, he noticed that two of the patients were missing. Now there were only two men and a woman. It was the young woman from the truck. She was grasping onto two bed frames, one stacked on top of the other. The man who looked after her held on too. As Rufus wondered if she was already dead, there was a sign of life from her. She grimaced with pain. Somehow Rufus found himself breathing a sigh of relief. A few more hours passed, but their situation hadn't changed. The water level had neither risen nor fallen. Rufus could feel his body temperature dropping, having been submerged in the water for so long. Inwardly, he had already accepted death. We don't have long left. Huh? He felt as if someone had called out to him, but there was no one around that had the strength left to do so. As he looked around, he thought he saw a movement on the surface of the water. Something black slowly moved its way toward Rufus. He narrowed his eyes in order to see more clearly. At first he thought it was some of the black eye core coming from one of the patients. However, it moved through the water as though it had a will, as though it were moving in a specific path. Frightened, Rufus tried pushing the water away from himself in an effort to expel the approaching black liquid. But the waves Rufus created had no effect on it. It moved independently of the current. Soon Rufus's suit was covered in the viscous black substance. The suit was already dirty, so it wasn't its usual pristine white, since he had been wearing it every waking second, day in, day out, in the event that the possibility of escape should arise. He looked at his sleeves, which were now dyed jet black. This is the end. The black liquid crept up his neck and finally reached his face. Rufus felt like it was trying to get into his mouth, so he desperately kept it closed. But there was still his nose. He quickly held it with his hand. Although he would suffocate, he would much prefer this death. But when the liquid reached his ears, he could no longer stop it. He pulled himself together because he didn't want to cry out under any circumstances. A short time later, he lost consciousness. <laughs> Mr. President. Mr. President. Rufus regained consciousness with the sound of someone calling to him. The flood was most unfortunate. Sorry I'm so late. Kilmister lowered the ladder into the water. Rufus grabbed onto it, wondering how he was still alive. As he looked around, the only remaining patients were the woman and the man who clung desperately to the bed frames. Hey, are you two all right? The man looked up. Help has arrived. At first the man looked at Rufus apathetically, but soon his expression signaled that he had understood. Quickly, he looked over at the woman and called out to her, and she weakly nodded her head in reply. Rufus wanted to help the woman and stretched out his hand to her. Suddenly, a gunshot rang out above their heads. The woman drifted away from the wooden frames, floating for a moment, then finally sank into the water. Pamela! The man let go of the frame and tried to swim toward her, but he didn't have the strength. Rufus, still grasping onto his own frame, pushed himself off the wall with his feet to catch up with him. When he reached him, he grabbed his arm. Pamela! He cried out, but could hardly even breathe. He wailed, but he couldn't find the strength to cry out any louder. Rufus dragged him through the water, and they reached the ladder. Get up. But... You must think of nothing but survival. The man stared for a while at the spot where Pamela had sunk into the water. Rufus realized that until now, he didn't know the woman's name. After a while, the man looked up at Kilmister. He had hatred in his eyes. We couldn't do any more for her. I was simply easing her pain. Pamela wouldn't hate me for that. Somehow Rufus doubted that Pamela would see it that way and could understand the man's reaction. He seemed hesitant, but soon started climbing the ladder. Indeed, nothing can be done for her now. But what about this man? What's your name? Judd. Judd? Now is the time. Leave Kilmister to me. Judd climbed up the ladder without responding. As he reached the top, Rufus made his way up behind him. Before he could set foot on the surface, 
he felt a sudden surge of pain tear through his entire body. He could feel something seeping from the corner of his mouth. As he wiped his mouth with the back of his hand, he saw the same sticky black liquid that had been oozing from Pamela and Judd. My, my, Mr. President. Looks like you'll also be needing the stimulant from now on. Kilmister had a cheerful tone in his voice. Ugh. Rufus heard Kilmister struggling above, and the next moment, his rifle sailed past him, falling into the water with a loud splash. Rufus suppressed the pain and looked up. It was obvious that someone was choking him from behind. You fool, Judd! I told you now is the time! Ugh. This time it was Judd who cried out in pain. Rufus was relieved and suddenly felt as though a weight had been lifted from him. He almost let go of the ladder. Finally, with all the strength he had left, he cried out. You're late. Oh, I'm sorry. Cliff Resort was built in the early days of the Shinra Company as a health spa for its staff. However, people preferred to spend their time by the sea than in the mountains, so it was eventually shut down. A number of the lodges remained in the same condition for all these years. Rufus, Sung, Elena, Reno, Rude, Kilmister and Judd split into two cars and made their way there. Waiting there were a large number of patients, most of whom were patients of Dr. Kilmister, who the Turks had brought from Cam. Rufus was suspicious at first, but Sung explained everything to him. A little over a week ago, Kilmister showed up at the Shinra building and called loudly for the Turks. Reno and Rude were on guard at the time. Kilmister said he had a letter from Rufus Shinner for them. Full of hope that they could finally find out about the whereabouts of Rufus, Reno and Rude came out of hiding and went to Kilmister. All the letter said was, give as much stimulant as possible to the doctor. Since they could make head nor tail of it, and were suspicious whether the letter really came from Rufus, they told him to come back the next day. Rude then went back to the makeshift office in Sector 5 to consult Sung, while Reno tailed Kilmister. Sung somehow felt that it really was the president's handwriting, but he couldn't say for sure. However, he came to the conclusion that they should give the doctor the stimulants, then secretly follow him. Reno followed Kilmister, which led him to Cam. Kilmister had apparently disappeared from his clinic about half a year ago, and the refugees had set up a small hospital of themselves. The patients celebrated his return and pleaded with him to treat them. Reno watched through the window as Kilmister grumpily examined patients. He came to the conclusion that Kilmister's own health was waning. The next day, Kilmister returned to the foyer of the Shinra building and examined the piled up boxes containing the stimulants. He opened one of the boxes, took out a canteen of water, diluted some of the stimulant in it, and drank it. The Turks looked at him dumbfounded as he sat on the ground and asked them to wait until the drug took effect. He then lay down. The Turks had no choice but to wait, since he was the only one who knew Rufus's whereabouts. After a while, Kilmister's complexion and mood had improved considerably. He ordered the Turks to carry the boxes to a location near Midgar. Clearly taking advantage of the situation, he asked Sung if there was a vacant facility he could make use of. He was looking for a remote but not too distant place where a large number of patients could live. According to Kilmister, he wanted to research a cure for the disease and make a contribution to the world. When it became clear that the Turks didn't quite trust him, he suddenly started telling them about Rufus's current condition. Since he could tell them exactly where Rufus was injured and how badly, the Turks had no choice but to believe him. In addition, he boasted that he was the person who rescued Rufus from captivity in Mutton's mansion and that the Shinra company should be grateful to him. When the Turks asked Kilmister why he had waited so long to contact them, he laughed, replying that he wanted to recruit Rufus Shinner to his cause. Cliff Resort immediately came to Sung's mind, and he decided to lead Kilmister there. The doctor was very impressed with the location, and immediately ordered the patients to be brought there. The Turks were reluctant to take orders from a drug-addled doctor but Kilmister threatened to leave them in the dark about Rufus's whereabouts if they didn't comply with his wishes. So they followed his instructions 
and made several trips to transfer patients from Cam to Cliff Resort. Kilmister ordered the Turks around as if they were his subordinates, but eventually he was so pleased with how things were going, he agreed to lead them to Rufus. The fact that they had arrived at the cave a little later than Kilmister was due to Reno losing sight of the doctor's truck in the heavy rain and flooded roads. Reno later insisted that his failure was actually a triumph by claiming that it was all thanks to his unique instincts that they had reached the cave even without any guidance. Rufus spent his time at the cliff resort as a patient. There was still no cure, so he just took the diluted stimulant, which merely suppressed the pain. On good days, when he didn't have a fever, the Turks filled him in on the latest developments and talked about their plans for the future. One day, something popped into Rufus's mind while talking to Reno. What's at the center of the new city? Hmm. A plaza. A big round plaza with nothing there. There's a road extending straight to Midgar from it, and surrounding it are other streets. That's why we call it the center of the city. In that case, build something there. Yes, build a monument there. What kind of monument? An ostensible kind. A monument to commemorate how the planet repelled Meteor. An ostensible kind? Then what's its true purpose? To claim our place. Ah, having it in the center of the city means Shinra owns the place. You come up with the best ideas, boss. The Shinra company was still being held responsible by the general public for the disaster, but since they provided materials and equipment, as well as fuel and medicines, they soon enjoyed some degree of respect and trust. One of Shinra's former executives, Reeve, had made a large contribution by sending building materials and workers from Juno. It was clear that Reeve had now assumed a hostile attitude towards Shinra, but as long as the work of the Turks and Valve rounded up former company employees for the benefit of society, he wouldn't cross them. Reno, with the help of some volunteers, began construction of the monument. Many people were excited by the idea of building a landmark in the middle of the city, and were happy to help. Amongst them there were some who even knew that Shinra were behind it and protested, but Reno always dealt with them the Turks way. The number of patients at Cliff Resort fluctuated, but all in all, the place worked wonderfully as a spa. However, one day there was uproar when Kilmister announced that at the present rate of consumption, the stimulant would soon be used up. Elena had become accustomed to life in the town, and had become close to the people, so one day she suggested they should distribute the stimulants in the town. Rufus had agreed to this, but it resulted in the depletion of stocks in the warehouse. So Rufus ordered the Turks to gather together anyone with pharmaceutical knowledge and begin the production of the stimulant, but under a different name. They had intended to use Shinra's facilities, and if necessary, they could negotiate something with Reeve. But Kilmister wasn't satisfied. He demanded that they should first secure a sufficient supply for Cliff Resort. Some and the others knew he was only thinking of his own dependents, but for some unknown reason, Rufus was always very lenient with him. The stimulant was obtained from the tail of the Nebel Bear. Since the dose of the active ingredient used to relieve pain wasn't as high as for its actual purpose, it was possible to produce a substantial amount from just one tail. Elena immediately set off to take care of the procurement of the active ingredient. Hey, Rude. Reno looked unusually troubled. Why is the boss being so kind to that kill mister? He's waiting for the results of his research. That's what I think. What research? If he's just going to waste money to kill a little pain, then even I can do it. I've provided some of my cells as one of the healthy people. He should find out something soon enough. I want to do some investigating of my own. We're surrounded by so many of these patients, yet nothing's happened to us. Weird, isn't it? The boss said it's not contagious. Reno admitted his doubts, and Rude gave him a playful punch to the side. How about a little training, partner? Been a while. Why? A healthy mind and a healthy body. If both are in harmony, we won't fall ill. Stop talking like an old geezer. 
In the same breath, Reno took a fighting stance, and soon they were engaged in a sweat-inducing sparring match. Hooligans. That's how the elderly patients at Cliff Resort referred to Rufus and his entourage. Some said they couldn't understand why the cohesion of the group was so strong. Even in times like these, they still saw themselves as the president's staff. But why they were still clinging on to this long outdated hierarchy wasn't quite clear. To outsiders, they seemed at times like children playing adults. Children who either had nothing enjoyable to look forward to at home, or had no home at all, and therefore indulged entirely in their game. One evening, two years after that faded day, Rufus dropped by Kilmister's room. Well, Doctor, shouldn't it be about time you revealed the results of your research to me? I'm very intrigued to learn what the relation between the disease I have and Genova is. Why not? So, first things first, with regard to an effective treatment, there has been no progress since the outbreak of the disease two years ago. Kilmister, who had obviously just administered a dose of his homemade stimulant, was in a great mood and delivered this devastating realization almost like a hilarious joke. Rufus listened to him without the slightest change in his facial expression. But I know, in principle, what the cause of this disease is. Kilmister continued, explaining how the first patients had come in direct contact with the live stream. He proudly announced that this realization came to him quite early, after he had questioned the patients. There's a common characteristic which connects all of the patients. They are all either depressed or had accepted death. Does this sound familiar, Mr. President? Indeed. A global catastrophe had just occurred. Naturally, they had many concerns and fears about the future and that death was near. That's why the number of patients had risen so much. Also, Kilmister then came to the subject of the black liquid. Rufus remembered the black liquid from the flooded cave. The black liquid that seemed to have a mind of its own. Among the patients that fell ill in the aftermath, most of them had seen this black fluid. And even those that claim not to have noticed anything must have either come in contact with this ichor without their knowledge, or drunk water mixed with it. One can be certain of that. Think about it, we're talking about water here. And water can reach anywhere it wants. What do you mean when you say, if you think of it like that? Rufus was curious about the doctor's choice of words. The pain and fever the patients suffer from are symptoms that their immune systems are fighting against a foreign body. Compared to other diseases, perhaps this one is too fierce for the body's immune system to handle, but with this opponent, it's perhaps no surprise. Have you found out the true source of this disease? Sephiroth's genes, or Genova's genes, or, or rather, remnants of their shared consciousness. It is as I told you before, they resemble the distinct characteristics of members of Soldier. Rufus froze at the mention of Sephiroth's name. In fact, this had vaguely crossed his mind when he was overpowered by the black liquid. Mr. President, I would like to investigate Genova. Where is it now? Kilmister showed no concern at Rufus's reaction. Unfortunately, I do not know of its whereabouts either. Then order your subordinates to find it. Let me think about it. Fine, but don't take too long. Rufus just nodded, then made his way out of the room, turning his back to Kilmister. Kilmister, in as good a mood as ever, appealed to Rufus again, still with his back to him. There was a project that I once proposed, which was rejected by Professor Hojo. I'm dying to give it a try. I'm sure I can create something even beyond Sephiroth. What about the cure? It's too late for those who already show symptoms of the disease. Those who are healthy should be fine as long as they don't cloud their hearts with darkness. You're welcome to announce this to the public, but don't mention the water. It would just lead to panic. Rufus still didn't turn around. Rufus, who himself suffered from the disease, left the room. 
The next morning, Kilmister was found dead. Somebody had shot him. As Sung examined his corpse, Judd approached him and confessed to the crime. Where did you get the gun? I can't tell you. I wasn't told to keep quiet about it, but I owe the person that much. When Sung reported the situation to Rufus, he didn't seem at all surprised. Sung, listen to me. Yes, sir. Shinra Company will find Genova and secure it. Yes, sir. Our goal is to keep it safe and not let anyone get their hands on it. Be it mad scientists, or... Rufus remembered Kilmister's words. Or remnants loitering in the life stream. Yes, sir. I'll make the necessary preparations at once. Reno and Rood were in the process of repainting the sign to Cliff Resort, to the name Healin Lodge. What does Healin mean? It means to heal the world. They turned to find Rufus approaching from behind them. Our methods may be a bit reckless, but... We are Shinra Company. It won't surprise anyone. Rufus's voice tingled with excitement. Let's get to work.